In section two of chapter seven, we are going to be focusing now on simplifying radicals, but this time around, we're going to be throwing in multiplication and division. So it's the same rules, same process. We're just adding a little more, another layer of complexity. We're going to have radicals in expressions that we're going to be multiplying different portions together. I got two slides with uh, problems. Problem number one, I have the square root of seven times the square root of three. Here is your golden rule when it comes to multiplying and dividing radicals, at least for now. Later, we will adjust this. But here's your golden rule. <clears throat> you can only ever multiply or divide two radicals together if and only if their indexes, their indices, are the same, meaning a square root can only multiply or divide into or by another square root. Cube roots and cube roots are the only ones that can work together. Fourth roots and fourth roots are the only ones that can work together. If you have a square root times a cube root, you can't do anything. You leave it as is. So for problem number one, I have the square root of seven times the square root of three. They're both square roots, so they can work together. The way we multiply is we take the exteriors of the radicals and multiply them together. We take the interiors of radicals and multiply them together. There are no exteriors of these two radicals. There's just stuff inside the radical. So I take the square root of seven and the square root of three. I take the seven and the three, multiply them together, and I get the square root of 21. The square root of 21 is a non-reducible radical. Therefore, that is my solution. I'm done. <clears throat> Problem number two. Before I do this, I want to take a special note of something. I have the square root of three times the square root of six. Individually, the square root of three doesn't simplify. Individually, the square root of six does not simplify. But as soon as I multiply them together, I am going to get the square root of three times six, which is 18, and that is simplifiable. So this is an important note. Once you do the product of two radicals, you need to analyze it to see if it's simplifiable. Because just because the, for, uh, the step before it wasn't simplifiable does not mean the step after it won't be. The square root of 18 is the same thing as the square root of 9 times the square root of 2. Here is my way of simplifying radicals. If you're dealing with a square root, what I like to have written off to the side are all of the perfect squares. 2 times 2 is 4, 3 times 3 is 9, 4 times 4 is 16, 5 times 5 is 25, 6 and 6 make 36, 7 and 7 make 49, and so on and so forth. The way that I simplify radicals, at least with the, when it comes to the integers, if this is a second root, I look at the perfect squares. If this is a cube root, I draw a list of the perfect cubes. I'm looking for the largest perfect square that divides into this. In this case, it's the 9. The reason I do that is because that is the same thing as the square root of 9 times 2. I can square root 9. Square root 9 is 3. The reason we look at the perfect squares, for those that do not know, is because the only thing we can square root are the perfect squares. So if you have a number and you're asking yourself, can that simplify in a square root? Look at all the perfect squares and figure out which is the largest one that divides into it. If it divides into it, you can pull it out. So my answer is 3 root 2. Problem number 2, I have 2 root 5 times 3 root 3. Now I have numbers on the outside. They're both square roots, so I can multiply. I take the outsides, the 2 and the 3, multiply them together to get 6. And I take the insides, the 5 and the 3, multiply them together to get the square root of 15. I ask myself, is the square root of 15 simplifiable? If it is, one of my perfect squares should divide into it nicely. None of them do, therefore this is my answer. And then problem number four, this is a distributive problem. This is the exact same thing as if I had two times x plus one. We would distribute the monomial to the binomial. Distribute the one thing on the outside to the two things on the inside. This is a monomial. This is a binomial. It's, a, it's uh, separated through subtraction. I'm going to take that 4 root 2 and distribute it to both terms. 4 root 2 times 3 root 6. 4 times 3 is 12. Root 2 times root 6 is root 12. 4 root 2 times 5. 
4 times 5 is 20. Root 2 has nothing to multiply by, so it just sticks around. The square root of 12 is reducible because 4 divides into the 12. That is the same thing as 12 times 4 times 3. And the square root of 4 is 2. And then 12 times 2 is 24. And now all the radicals are simplified and we are done. I want to do one more problem that looks super complex but is literally the exact same thing I just got done doing. This again is a monomial times a binomial. I am going to take that crazy looking monomial and distribute to both of the binomials, both terms. So for the first one, <clears throat> negative 5 times there's an invisible 1 on the front. Negative 5 times 1 is negative 5. The cube root of 4x squared times the cube root of 2x squared is the cube root of 8x squared. Minus negative 5 times 6. Negative 6 is positive 30 times the third root of 4x squared. I can take the cube root of 8, and that should be an x cubed, not an x squared. The cube root of 8 is 2. Cube root of x cubed is x. There's nothing left underneath the cube root. And then negative 5 times 2x is going to be negative 8x. This is my solution. Problem number two. I have a cube root divided by a cube root. That is the same thing as the cube root of that written as an entire fraction. 16x to the seventh over 2x squared. 16 divided by 2 is 8. x to the seventh divided by x to the second. Well, those two x's on the bottom would eliminate with 2 of the 7 on top, leaving you with 5. The cube root of 8 is 2. The cube root of x to the fifth is x with the remainder of 2. And this is our solution. Problem 3 is going to have a hitch to it. It's a hitch that you will not see coming, but it is something that I will explain. Problem number 3. I have the fourth root of something divided by the fourth root of something. I can write that as the fourth root of an entire fraction, 32x to the third, divided by 2x to the fifth. That is going to be equal to 32 divided by 2 is 16. And I have 3x's on top, 5 on bottom, so that would be x to the second power on bottom. The fourth root of 16 is 2. The fourth root of x squared doesn't do anything. Now, a lot of you might be thinking that is our final answer, and that would be wrong. There is a rule in Algebra 2 that I will go over right now. We do not want radicals in the denominator, so I don't like that there's a fourth root in the denominator. So what I do is I ask myself, what do I wish that x to the second power was? I really wish that was an x to the fourth power, because I could fourth root x to the fourth power. I can have that occur as long as I multiply it by the fourth root of x squared. But if I do that to the bottom, I also have to do that to the top. Because when I multiply the fourth root of x squared by another fourth root of x squared, I get the fourth root of x to the fourth power, which is just x. And then the numerator will turn into 2 times the fourth root of x squared. And now I have a fraction with no radical in the denominator. I have what is called rationalize this function. I've turned it from an irrational style solution with a radical in the denominator to a rational style solution with a non-radical in the denominator. Problem number four is unique because I have a cube root, a fifth root, and a square root. None of those combine together, ever. So normally this would be our answer. You wouldn't do anything to it. The only issue is I don't like radicals in my denominator, so I've got to get rid of them. I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by the square root of x. That way I can get the square root of x squared on the bottom, which is just x. 
But now the numerator is going to be the cube root of x times the fifth root of x times the square root of x. And now I don't have any radicals in my denominator. I am done.